Welcome back to another episode of Diabetics Doing Things. I cannot tell you how excited I am for this interview today, guys. You guys have listened to the podcast for a long time, then you'll know that one of my favorite interviews, and when people ask me what interview they should listen to or they should start with, I almost always say my interviews with my friend Jeremy Robertson, who is here with us in Dallas, Texas today. So I'm pulling up my questions that I have. Like I am actually organized for this podcast, but um, I'm so psyched that you're here, man. Remember last time he was here? I wasn't here. Yeah, well. <laughs> I've heard this story, though, because like you said, you were very excited for this episode. I was. So I was telling Ashley and Eritrea about the last time you were in Texas, which was in 2018. Yeah. And those of you who listen to the podcast and really know me, love, know, love to, like, I love saying yes to things. So you were like, hey, I'm coming to Dallas. I'm doing this conference. You know, it's a, it's a thing I'm doing on the side. If I could stay with you guys, that'd be awesome. And we were like, oh, I was like, oh, yeah, no problem. And in between the time I said yes to that to, and the time that you came to visit, uh, my dad got sick. We got Enzo as a puppy. And I like totally was out of sight, out of mind. So when you came in, we, we had a, we had Enzo who was like, we had only had for maybe four weeks. He was a really excitable, a puppy. very excitable puppy. He's still very excitable, still pretty puppyish. Yeah. Uh, and then on Jeremy's first night, so he like roll in, like, I don't know how many hours of travel from Australia, like so many difficult day coming in. And the first night, like Michael J. Fox, the cat like throws up in the bed. And so like goes to the bathroom on the floor, like our little apartment is in chaos. My dad's in the hospital. Like I'm, you know, frazzled all over the place. And Jeremy just could not have been a more gracious and awesome guest. And even in the middle of that, you got to go to a conference. And I think I talked about this when we did our second interview mm. where you got to meet one of the heads of the FAA yep. and talk about the legislation, which eventually now has brought you back here. Yeah, that's right. And look. As a testament to how good a host you were, I, I don't actually remember any of that happening with your animals. <laughs> I think I was just so excited to you know, meet you in person and stay with you guys. Well, we were like so happy to have you. And we are just anxious about our animals causing stress on people all the time, which I assume is how people are with their kids. No. So, okay. <laughs> and I don't have kids. No, but you, both of you guys are so cute because I would have left. I would have I would have packed my shit, dog. Oh. And I'll catch you next time. <laughs> really, the only thing I remember was Michael J. Fox. Because you know, I'd occupied his bed. Yeah. Uh, just waking up with him next to my face on the pillow most mornings. It just makes me laugh because it's like you guys connect already on the diabetes. So it's like, okay, we've done that. But on the human level, you also really seem kindred spirits. Just, well, oh, yeah. yeah. Speaking of Enzo. <laughs> I think that's something that I also hadn't re haven't really shared. And that's oh. that, that's all these dogs. Hey, oh, no. Bowie, what oh, are you doing? Uh, so we had a little bit of a dog interruption, not Enzo, but another one of our office dogs at Recreation, because we're recording this in person at Recreation Dallas headquarters. And those of you who are watching on YouTube can see us here. But there's a couple of things. So because you were, are based in Australia, the first time we did an interview was a weird day. And I like remember it very specifically for a couple of reasons. And I was telling Ashley and Eritrea about this on our diabetes uh, status call the other day, our diabetes doing things status call. So I played golf with some friends that morning who I'd never really played golf with before. Kendrick Lamar had released a, an album that day, so we were listening to that on the course. And then I decided that I was going to make my way from the golf course where we were at to my parents' house without GPS because I was like, oh, this will just be an adventure. And I got so turned around and lost in like this very, you know, eclectic, strange part of Dallas. So anyway, I roll up to my parents' house, barely like pass go, do not collect $200 like Monopoly thing and like run upstairs to their guest room, set up the podcast, which I had never recorded there to talk to you for the first time. And I remember that episode, like I had had some people from New Zealand and some people from international like, communities on the podcast at that point, but I never really realized how many people were listening to it or how they were. And you were telling me about a trip that you were taking to maybe your in-laws or a family trip hmm. and you had to join your family there later. So you really like, had a long road trip by yourself and you were listening to the podcast. And that for me, for the first time, like helped me understand that the podcast was global. Like people really were listening to it everywhere. And so I just, I think about that and I hold it as very special time for me. So that's a lot of our friendship as well as like, and I just love your story and, and you're, you're my great friend. So thank you for being here today. Uh, absolute pleasure to be here again. So you've come back to Dallas and I think that's where we were going to get to is that all of this traveling and being a pilot and these other episodes that you've done have brought you back here, right? Yeah, so the good news is if you can go back and listen to our episode in 2019 about the FAA allowing type one diabetic pilots to get their class one medical. So you are now 
do you have your class one medical or and, and yes. you're you're going through the training to be a commercial pilot again yeah so australia i guess it was work the authorities in australia were working through the same process kind of in parallel to the faa here in the u.s regarding insulin treated diabetics and commercial pilots and the approval came through here i think in november 2019 this medical and it went from there and in australia it was it was April 2020. I was the first one issued in Australia. And of course, I think we all remember what happened in that kind of time frame. COVID went, the airline industry ground to a halt. So any, any possible jobs for pilots, especially in Australia, just evaporated. So after, and that was, that was about almost 10 years. It was just after 10 years after I'd been diagnosed. So I thought, you know, 10 years, I'm finally now in a position to, to get back to some commercial flight. And that, that goal just disappeared again because mm. there was no hope of employment until the aviation industry recovered. And at that point, yeah, we had no idea what course COVID was going to be. So yeah, I, I just continued working as a doctor, which was my profession at the time. And the industry recovered. The airline started recruiting again. I've been fortunate enough to find myself employed by an airline again and be flying their 737s or 737s as Americans say <laughs> and we are so busy with training in Australia that we've run out of capacity to do all of the 737 training in Australia so a lot of airlines are, are offshoring their training so the company I work for is actually renting a, a simulator off Southwest Airlines here in Dallas so I'm here in Dallas for a month 737 training Getting that hospitality train in Southwest, baby. You know, they say, you know, Dallas is the Australia of the South. You know, the Australia of the... <laughs> no, uh, they don't say that. But, well, it's, it's so great to have you back. And I kind of want to talk a little bit about the emotional journey of getting your class one back because there's been so many, there's been a lot of wins, right? Mm. And I use your story when I talk to people about how people respond to a diagnosis and how everyone is different and how mere mortals like Eritrea and myself, like, you know, she was a child and I was a teenager, but, you know, we had this like, oh, oh no, kind of sense of, you know, with the way that we were going to live, you know, has drastically changed and we felt a certain way about, it. and I know you've talked about you going through that as well, but becoming a doctor, going to med school, practicing as a physician, and then even getting to work as a physician with airlines to now be able to be back where you were nearly 14 years ago this week, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, yeah, where you're diagnosed in Los Angeles, you grew up wanting to be a pilot. You know, talk. You talked about going to air shows with your dad, and you know, falling in love with the sky. I've learned a little bit since getting to know you. We've done some work on the professional side at Recreation on pilot recruitment, and you know, sometimes like being a pilot is born. Like you just, you know, a lot yeah. of those guys, and you know, Jerry Brzezowski, friend of the podcast, you guys just love to fly. Mm. And getting that taken away and then getting it back, but then still, still having to go through a nearly five-year journey to get to where you're still, you're still training to get back in the cockpit. What's that been like? Oh, well, it's yeah, a series of highs and lows, I guess. Uh, yeah, I guess the, the journey from initial diagnosis through to receiving my medical was, I think, was just incremental. Yeah, there were no major setbacks in terms of getting my back there were no giant leaps forward with the exception when that medical was finally issued that was a pretty slow and steady kind of journey but yeah the last four years have been a bit more of a, a roller coaster that because i've been working with the, the the regulator in australia i kind of knew that my medical was probably coming and when COVID kicked off i didn't hear from them didn't hear from them i was just about to write them an email yeah, i composed it in my head saying we've probably got bigger fish to fry let's just put this project on hold and yeah that, that email was rattling around in my head when i got the email with my medical being issued i was that just kind of added an element of being unexpected at the same time knowing that i had this medical in towards you know that had been a three-year process to get that medical approved and there was now no way for me to actually practically use it. I remember I was working, working in family medicine at the time and I had a gap between patients. I just remember 
have my desk whether I should cry. But just you know, the, the irony of the situation. Yeah. And and then COVID, I think yeah, everyone has stories of what they did for work personally and professionally during COVID. Yeah, I'm the same. I got got an opportunity for a job that was very unexpected. It was just going to be for a month. And then there were some staffing changes while I was there and suddenly I was the only job at this company for many months. Fantastic opportunity for my career. Lots of great experience. A ridiculous level of work, never to repeat. And and then suddenly ending up in a position where it's, I applied to two major airlines, job offers from two major airlines. Feast family. Yeah, just a ridiculous years. Yeah, now I feel like at the point actually employed by an airline, been allocated an airplane, doing specific training for that airplane. You know, there's about six or seven weeks left in that trip. Be there. I'm really just trying to focus on my training. We were talking a little bit about that on the way over here. Visualizing that day where you're back in the cockpit and going through the pre-flight and you're there with your, you know, your captain as, as a first officer. Have you, how many times have you visualized that over the last 14 years? Yeah, countless. Yeah. It's, and you're close. It's, yeah, you're, that's it's right, right there. Like in the scheme of things, I'm this close. <laughs> it's nice to hear a story where we already know that there's a happy ending, you mm. know? But as you were like, I don't know, in my head, I see like a Hercules type journey, some Odysseus thing where you have to beat all these monsters, get through all these beasts. How do you get to the next challenge? I think this is something I struggle with every time we talk to our guests because you guys all seem so motivated and driven. It's like you didn't ever just sit in the room in the dark and cry. Like you didn't just want to give up. Yeah, yeah. There were days where I wondered what I was doing. Yeah, medical training is hard. It's hard academically. It's hard emotionally. It's hard physically. Working hours. And there were days where I really questioned my life choices. But... And the last four years have been particularly draining. I think I'm just looking forward to having a job and just for 12 months, just going to work, doing my job. Okay. Just, I just want to cruise for a bit because yeah, literally the last 14 years, it's been a constant, just about out of push. So I need to, yeah, a year of just cruising. Yeah. And I'm sure there's, you know, there's things in the back of my mind that I, that incomplete things I want to work on, things I want to improve in, in the diabetes space, other little personal projects. There's plenty for me to do. Just need to Is it a personality do thing? Do you think you guys are just, because it kind of just reminds me of you, do you just have push in you? Like there's just an unlimited amount of push? Like I think for uh, sure limited for me. I can't, you know. Yeah, well, I, I guess till now I never found my limit. Recently found my limit. So, okay. Uh, yeah. So where did, did, where did, were there moments where you needed to find more push and you were like, I just, I need to get to this point or I need to get here. What helped you get to that, to the next step? Well, I guess, and one of my neighbors said this the other day, he said, you know, you seem to be the, the master of the long game and that helps with diabetes management, but <laughs> all these kind of personal and professional goals, it has, yeah, it, I guess it hasn't phased me that it's. Something happens and it's like, oh, that's going to be another year to get that to happen. It's just, I can always see that end goal and I'm happy with that as long as I'm working towards it. So I think that, yeah, that mindset wow. helps. And that's it's not something I've ever consciously adopted. It's just part of personality. Interesting. You yeah. might have ran marathons in another life. I, I know. don't know. That's what it's yeah. giving. It It is an interesting like allegory for diabetes because it is, you know, you talked about ups and downs. We've talked about the long game, you know, you, you blink and 14 years goes by, you know, and you're managing your sugars every day. Mm. How many injections, how many, you know, finger pricks, how many CGM changes, yeah, so yeah. many. And you don't notice them day by day, but as you zoom out, you start to say, oh, wow, I've like check, checked my sugar 30,000 times. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's remarkable. I think I want to shift into that, into my question, but like, you know, it is a, it is a long game. I think life is, you know, unfortunately we don't know how much time we have, right? So it's both a short and long game. You have to live for the present and also, you know, pace yourself for, yeah. for the long journey. Yeah. But, um, you've mentioned something about, you know, being a good example for life with diabetes, but what I want to 
to know and like I'm curious about from your journey as a healthcare provider, like looking back, how has your journey practicing medicine made you see your own diabetes differently or, or even change the way that you think about it? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question because it certainly gives you a slightly different perspective on you know, your own personal condition. I definitely remember the week at medical school where we were just focusing on diabetes for a week and just learning about all the horrible ways you can die from this disease. It's uh, pretty sobering hearing doctors speak in doctor speak to other doctors about all the things that can go wrong whilst sitting there as a person with diabetes trying not to take it all personally. Yeah, that was pretty sobering. It's hard um, to do it. Yeah, I, I yeah. find I, I found it very difficult sometimes mm. to hear people talking Can't in, do that, in platitudes. Now. You yeah, know, yeah. And because like you said, it's only a week. Yep. And you know, but for you it's every minute of every day for her. So and I, we talk a lot about patient lived experience here on the podcast and how important it is because we it's not just one week for us, mm. even though, you know, it's formal medical training and doctor speak as you characterize, but we know so much about what's going on. And so then to be able to see it and talk about some of the things that are uncomfortable for us to think about, obviously really sobering. Yeah, yeah. And then out in clinical practice, working in the hospitals, that that gives you a very skewed viewpoint of people with diabetes because you only see the people that are, you know, have ended up in DKA or have not managed themselves for a long period of time and have developed complications. So seeing young people with significant levels of complication was really, really very sobering and upsetting because in Australia, the public health care system makes all the, you know, the medical side of things available for themselves. Um, so that, I, that, that definitely gave me more motivation to, to focus on my own diabetes. But I guess I, what I tried to do, I was very open with diabetes, so all the doctors that I worked with all knew I had type 1 diabetes and would see me managing it all the time. So I guess I just became, that was my little mission. I would just talk to doctors about type 1 diabetes because it's a recurring theme that as a doctor, if you don't specialize in it or if you don't encounter it on a regular basis, it does. It becomes a week of med school that you probably don't cross paths with again. Doctors just aren't familiar with it. So, yeah, that opportunity for doctors that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis to, to interact with it, that was my little... It's my little attempt to educate the... Yeah, like a little re-engagement. He took a pledge without even knowing. <laughs> you took a pledge. No, no, there's this pledge to end stigma, right? And I think mm. that we forget that stigma is perpetuated in everyday conversations and small like societal opinion. Yep. So mm -hmm. if you are talking to everyday physicians on a human level, it's like, hey, see me, Jeremy, like see me as a patient instead of XYZ person who walks through the door... And that's yeah. going to humanize people with diabetes more to them. Like you are defeating stigma in a way or fighting it. It's like, let's get this man a superhero cape at this point. Like, yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's a very personal choice because I know some yeah. people aren't comfortable with being open with their diabetes. And I work and with it, a doctor in the hospital system. It's hard to just be yeah. vulnerable enough to do that. Yeah. I mean, not yeah. everyone has to, right? So when you make the choice to, I don't think one even realizes the mission that they're setting on, right? Because maybe you're like, it's my secret mission. But I think we all, well, the people in this room, I, I forget how often I talk about diabetes because yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm just yeah. all constantly talking about it. Yeah. Well, that's it. I, I was annoyed. I didn't pack. I've got half a dozen tacky type 1 diabetes t-shirts uh -huh. of various kinds. And I didn't bring any with me, uh, which is very unusual. So yeah, I'm normally wearing t-shirts. Got I mean, you're wearing the merch. You've yeah, got the hat. You've got the JRF hat on. you got yes. more merch than anybody in this room. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. My CGM is usually visible with a bright colored sticker on it. Yeah. You're just cool. I thought it was like the solar system. Yeah. A little space yeah. man. It's, yeah. Yeah. Men, men's yeah. is trending. Men's hey, cool. I, I wear, I have a little Peels thing on my pump now, uh, and cool. I never thought I would be a sticker guy on my pump. Yeah. I'm a donut T1 Tactical girly. Look at you go. Shout out yeah. to our friends over at T1 Tactical. And Peels yeah, I haven't got anything for my pump yet. We got to get you just, some. Yeah. Get some fun. Yeah, we got to get you to hook, hook you up with some stickers. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe we do like, maybe we just pitch some aviation stickers for for you guys. Wouldn't yeah, that well, be I've cool? been thinking that I should make a CGM sticker because the G6... Kind of looks like the fuselage of a stubby airplane. You mm -hmm. can make oh, yeah. Wings in an engine and something. I think we got ourselves a good idea. Listen. Cooking up here. This is on the, the list yeah, of things there we to do go. in my, my brain. <laughs> I love it. To. Right off the dome. Maybe we can help. Maybe we can help. Yeah, someone out there in T1 land who's a, a graphic designer or something, please make me an airplane sticker for my Say CGM. less. Hey, I was going to say, careful Call what you Santiago, wish for because like, we're going to make that work. <laughs> 
Okay, I do want to talk about pilots in the T1D community because you guys are very close and, you know, there's Facebook groups and there's websites and and obviously we talked about Jerry. Wait, there's a lot of them? There's like a bunch of you guys? Well, oh. on a global scale, <laughs> yeah. you, if you put us all in one room, there's probably quite a lot. But, uh, you know, the Venn diagram of pilots and people with type 1 diabetes is pretty narrow. Oh, okay. Pretty small group, so, but they, okay. I, th I feel like you guys are very well networked. Okay. Uh, and I think the the peer recommendation community where mm. you find somebody who's interested in aviation or or is a pilot and you know whether commercially or just for fun hobbyist yeah you guys get connected pretty quickly it yeah. seems so in the last four years or so what have those conversations been like as you guys are kind of seeing those people like you mentioned like like Pietro like John who are or are, are now in the captain's seat seat living with type one. Yeah, and then you know you also have like the hobbyists like like Jerry who are flying around mm -hmm. and going to and you know meeting other pilots with diabetes and kind of evangelizing it in that way. What have those conversations been like? Yeah, the conversations have definitely shifted because in Australia there were you know before the class one medicals became available there was there was really me and you know a couple of other pilots kind of pushing it in Australia. So the majority of pilots in Australia with type one diabetes were private pilots flying recreation and yeah I would try and find them and chat to them and but the conversations yeah they were just they were people that flew for fun so there was not that drive to get a class one medical or change the rules or back happy with with what was there and because the career wasn't available there weren't those conversations with young people wanting to become commercial pilots mm -hmm. it was that unfortunate phrase you know oh, well there's only three things you can't do once you're diagnosed. But yeah, in the last four years, since the medical has become available, that conversation has just shifted young people getting in touch with me or, or any of the other pilots that are flying. And just, I've always wanted to do this. I didn't know you could do it. How do I do it? You have to a superhuman right. diabetic. Just reassuring them, you know, have a good conversation about their levels and what they're using to maintain their diabetes. And you, you will probably be fine. These are the rules. This is the process. Go off and do it. And you know, I can think off the top of my head of five or six young pilots in their late teens, early 20s who are at various stages of their training or getting their first job in Australia. And it's, it's just been so rewarding to, to see that happen in the last three or four years. That's yeah. really cool, man. And like, you know, even going on seven years since you were on this podcast for the first mm. time, you know, those people were 12, 13 years old, you know, and, and now able to, in the last four years, be able to say, oh, okay, well, this is an option for me. And like you said, it used to be the three things, like, right, military, scuba diving, and flying an airline pilot. Like, now it's just maybe two. So it used to be having a baby too, right? Like, you weren't supposed to do, I don't know. I thought there was yeah, a well, bunch of stuff you there, could do. Well, there, there might have been, like, you know, if we had been podcasting 40 years ago, and there probably more than 10 things that yes. they used to say you couldn't do. That's so, I... There's probably a lot of things. This is such a random aside. Do you know who Condor Man is? Who? Sorry. Condor Man? No, I okay, don't Okay, do know. you know who Condor, Condor Man is? Is that like a, is it's like a, a Doug thing. thing? No. Okay, so it's a random aside, but it's diabetes related. I just thought of it because you were like, you have to be like a superhero to fly around with diabetes and be a pilot. So at Camp Sweeney. Oh, the, Sweeney, our, the Sweeney heads are going to For all up. our Sweeney listeners, there's a story at Camp Sweeney that they tell about this man named Condor Man who was a type 1 diabetic whose parents owned a bubblegum factory and made him like chew all this very sugary bubblegum until he went blind and had retinopathy. This is the story they tell kids. Are you looking at my face, <laughs> listeners? And he, then he went blind, and so he would go to Sweeney, and he would like go on the all-camp hike, but he's blind. So he got lost one day during the all-camp hike, and this monster person, Dr. Zord Meridian, why do I know this story, took him into his lair and was like, do you want to have superpowers? And the kid was like, well, I guess I'm here. He's like, okay. So he puts him in this machine. He turns him into half condor, half man, but doesn't cure his diabetes. And he becomes condor man. And he would fly over Camp Sweeney every Monday night and drop trident gum for all the children. And I would stand outside with all the other little children and stick my hands up in the air for the gum. But I always thought people could fly with diabetes because I didn't know that it wasn't allowed. No, You guys haven't heard this story? No. No, I, I, I can't believe you think this is a this is like a widely circulated story. I think we'd have to get... The origins of Condor Man, now I'm very curious about. we got to get more real, on the podcast. But more there is someone sweeties. with diabetes who's flying around in North Dallas mm. dropping gum for kids who has diabetes. So we should find them and have them on next because I didn't yeah. know you didn't know them. I, I'm blown away by this story, first I'm of so all. sorry. But yeah, I... Okay. 
<laughs> this is this is, you you did say random aside. Which I, I was like, I do. You... Anyways, back to the real question. Okay, so, um, you talked about the when people are curious about what it actually what the requirements of your blood sugar management diabetes control technology are. Yeah. Are you able to share like kind of gener generally what those look like? Yeah. I mean, very broadly to meet the requirements of the medical, uh, for a class one medical, you must be using a continuous glucose monitor in Australia. That's one of the rules in Australia. Your HbA1c has to be less than 8%, which is not, not a superhuman target. You know, you don't have to be one of those militant low carbers that maintains a 5.5, less than eight. And they're now starting to look more at the CGM derived data as well as indicators of stability, which is really good. So they're looking for, for various times in range and broadly speaking between five and 15 millimoles, which is what 100 and 300 wacky units you guys use about more than 80% of the time. So that's a pretty broad target, and they don't want less than four millimoles, that less than 80, 75, more than 5% of it. So that's the kind of the control requirements. They're starting to look more at the coefficient of variation, things like that, that the CGMs generate, but that's not in, in black and white yet. Uh, and then more broadly, things that your endocrinologist or your family physician would look at want to look at your cholesterol levels are your kidney function they want you to have seen a optometrist or an ophthalmologist to check you don't have retinopathy they don't want you to have any long term complications from diabetes oh, and they want you to have seen a diabetes educator to verify that you've undertaken a course carb count do you have to like repeat the course stuff. so that you make sure you didn't forget the course no, or? No, that's, <laughs> at the moment it's just a one off uh, yeah, entry requirement okay so so yeah, generally, if, if you fall in those kind of bounds with your diabetes control, then you would be eligible to apply and you likely be successful. And then there are, it gets more complicated then to maintain the medical because it starts to incorporate your level of control while you're flying. I have to, to split out my CGM data for the time that I'm flying and provide that as well. Yeah, that's what, that was going to be my follow-up question mm -hmm. was... If you could take us through your diabetes component of your pre-flight checklist, like what, what does that yeah. look like? And maybe it varies from time to time, but what, you know, for you as you're starting up and, you know, to the extent that you can share, you know, how do how does that factor into before you're, you know, taken off? Well, the, I guess it probably starts with, yeah, me and my diabetes several hours to a day beforehand. I'm just going to be doing things or not doing things to maximize the stability of my diabetes. So I'm not going to be having any food that I'm not familiar with or I'm not going to be going and doing an unscheduled significant amount of exercise or something like that. No all-you-can-eat pizza buffet. No, no. Routine no. life for routine flight, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, whatever I can do to promote stability in my levels, I'll be doing that. And then in terms of the actual rules for flying, I've got to have my CGM up and running at least two hours prior to the flight start. And that's pretty normal because it's just on all the time. And then I've got to make sure I'm just above, well, between five and 15 millimoles, you know, between 100 and 300 uh, for the flight to commence. And that's, that's really it. Now, it's not that complicated. And to be honest, it's probably not too different to how you would run your day if you were going to be doing something that you knew was going to take a lot of your attention anyway, where you didn't have as much attention to focus on your diabetes. You know, yeah. If you had a, a big exam or you, know, you were going, going and doing something where you didn't have access. To. Yeah. So, so that's, that's the kind of mindset. Just whatever I can do to promote stability. And then in flight, if, if I do deviate outside that 5 to 15, that 100, 300 range, the rules just say, do what you normally do to fix it. So if I'm low, it says, you know, check your blood sugar level and take corrective action. It then has some hard limits. So if you if I go all the way up to 20, almost 400, 350 to 400, then it says I have to hand over control to the other pipe and I, and I have to take some corrective insulin. Likewise, if my blood glucose drops below 4 millimoles, what did I say that was? 75? Yeah, 75. 
I have to eat rapid acting carbs and move it over to the other pile. But again, coming back to the requirements of getting the medical, you know, I've demonstrated that my risk of ending up in those positions is really, really small. So that's that's how it's supported. It kind of sounds really logical, honestly. Of it's like, like insurance. Yeah. You've never had a, a, the progressive thing that they make you put in your car so they can like, I don't know, I don't have progressive, but I've seen it on TV and they like measure like how fast you're driving to see yeah. how much your insurance is going to be every month because yeah. I guess they're measuring their risk. you're slamming on your brakes. And yeah, like, are you, you know. texting while you're driving? Are you picking yeah. up your phone? So I guess it's a similar way of them analyzing the risk factor of your but, diabetes. And that's a, you've just summarized the whole of aviation medicine. Ah. <laughs> it's risk, and, and it's specifically it's incapacitation risk due to whatever medical condition you have. So if you can demonstrate that your incapacitation risk meets the threshold for certification, you should be able to hold a medic. Right, because like what's stopping a regular pilot from having a, I don't know, I hope this never happens to anyone, but like an aneurysm, a seizure. Heart like attack, a, yeah. Heart attack, stroke, mm-hmm. like a regular schmegular dude can get well, on a plane. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, some of that thinking, exactly what we're talking about, factored into at least the beginnings of allowing pilots with insulin-dependent diabetes to get their class 1 medical back yeah. because you can track through the continuous glucose monitor. That's exactly right. You can quantify your incapacitation risk because you can right. show the authorities exactly how much time out of your entire life you spend at a very low blood glucose level. It's... And even like, you know, just reviewing your flight logs, like you mm. said, you have to track it during the flight separately from the rest of your sh- of your time. Yeah. So during flight, like you could have 100% adherence to to the protocols over a long period of time. And then again, it's like, okay, well, the risk of this is fairly yeah. low. And that that kind of data was exactly one of the things that supported the change in Australia. You know, the UK had been allowing insulin-dependent diabetics to fly for a number of years, and they actually published their follow-up data. So they, they published for all that in-flight data how many times the pilots went high, low, et cetera basically validated the protocol work. So that was one of the bits of you know, published medical evidence that supported the change in Australia. Wow. Lit. Yeah. So CGM's data, big data. It is. And, you know, what I, I like to say, we're now 40 minutes into the podcast before a Rob quote, so here oh we go. Oh, my God, we made it. <laughs> you know, what gets measured gets managed. Mm. You can oh track God. that. Yep. You can see it. And I think that's where, you know, when we talk about time and range, as the you know new global measurement for diabetes adherence compared to A1C, which is yeah. still a good measure, but doesn't give you the full picture of, yeah. especially re- relative to incapacitation yes, and, exactly. and, and blood sugar variants, yeah. you're able to see all that going on all at once. And day to day control, like you said, routines, right? So like you can you can also, I guess, man, you're like the perfect person to do this. You're a doctor and you have diabetes, so you're like the guy. I don't know. But so you can look at things really and be like, oh, that's what I'll do on flight days because that's what works. And then yeah. just mimic, mimic, well, mimic. Well, as usual, you're right on point. But that was one of the reasons why you were able to have some of the discussions you were able mm. to have. That's exactly right. I uh, can't remember when it happened, but it, well, it was a little epiphany. I'm like, right, I'm now a qualified doctor, have type 1 diabetes, and I was also a qualified airline pilot. How many of me are there out there in the world that could solve this problem? I should probably do something with this. So, yeah. <laughs> what a moment a small yeah. epiphany just let me just change the world well when you're an expert at two things uh, there's a principle about that of like you know if you can be an expert three. At, at two well I, I three obviously but like the, the the principle is just with two so obviously Jeremy just over I have a new white man role model <laughs> hey, yeah not exactly you. <laughs> as you sh- as you should I'm not I'm just the I'm just no the it's just very it's just very interesting to be like this is you're uniquely standing at like this crossroads kind yeah, of that's exactly right I stand at the, the intersection of two professional fields that don't really interact very much so, well, and they're also both really highly regulated, and there's really specific criteria. And in order for you to speak competently to one or the other, like you have to really understand a lot of things that there isn't a lot of overlap with. So, you know, yeah, it gives you a, right. both, a unique perspective. Pro- both professional fields have their own unique language. If you've ever sat and listened to air traffic control or sat, you know, sat in a room with a bunch of pilots and listened to them talk about work don't understand any of that. Same with doctors, when doctors get into doctor speak. Yeah. So being able to translate has yeah, been really useful. Be an interpreter, right? Mm-hmm. And I think also like on the legislative side, like not really understanding either of those. Yeah. And so like, you know, a pilot could go in front of that group and a doctor could go in front of that group and not be able to create the same resonance as an interpreter. Very cool. Is there anything that you like looking back on the journey where you're like, 
oh, I could have done that different. Maybe that. I don't know. Is are there any like in retrospect? You know, hindsight twenty twenty. You know what? Because I'm because I still don't feel like I'm quite there. Okay. I'm not qualified in the seat check to line as an airline pilot yet. I actually haven't done that. I haven't sat down and reflected on the journey yet. It's still a work in progress. In still mind. on the boat. It's yeah. all good. Yeah. Yeah. Getting close to the finish line though. Like we have, you know, back yeah. to that, like, you know, visualization of where we are yeah. six, seven weeks from now, this podcast is going to come out and, you know, I'm going to share that social media post when you, when, when you make it. And I, I kind of want to talk about that too. You know, when you're in that first officer chair, obviously like, you know, I was asking, do you have like a, an announcement plan for the loudspeaker over the plane? And you're like, no, 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 probably just going to be a regular flight for everybody else. But you know, visualizing yourself and even as you're in the simulator, like working here over the past couple of weeks, it's, it's a living visualization of what that's going to be like. Do you feel like that's going to have some sort of culmination for you of this like really exciting, you know, long winded winding journey? Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm just that like, first takeoff. I really just hope I don't burst into tears, you know, um, <laughs> hopefully it'll, I'll be able to remain a bit more controlled, but I think certainly at the, at the end of that first flight, I think there will be a lot of, Probably a lot of emotion ready to be released. Cry? You should uh, you should proudly cry. I'll, cry. I'll, yeah, I'm hoping to have my wife on yeah. the flights. Yeah. A couple of my friends have indicated that they would very much like to be on the flight as well. So I want to go. I haven't been to Australia, so it's a little bit of a little bit more of a commute. But I want to go. I want yeah. to. That could be our travel. I'm to figure that out. I have to figure that out. <laughs> our offsite. Yeah, <laughs> I have to allocate some budget in different places than I had planned. But we'll, yeah, maybe we'll figure that out. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. I can... I'm just, I'm psyched, man. I really am. I, cause you know, the, at the beginning of this podcast and we've kind of been revisiting some of our favorite guests from the first 100 episodes because a Eritrea wasn't there to interview them. And B, I think we've come a long way, a, just a long time. Mm -hmm. And I, and a lot more conversations and I'm a lot more educated about diabetes, not just from my own perspective. So remembering and, you know, I think a lot of my early motivation was to talk to people who were also experiencing things that people with diabetes weren't supposed to do. I'm doing the air quotes for those who are listening. Like, you're not supposed to be a pilot. You're not supposed to scuba dive. You know, hmm. there's a few things that you're just flat out not allowed to do. And I think I, in my spirit, wanted to revolt against those, wanted to push back against this resist. idea. Yeah, resist these limitations, yeah. uh, whether they're real or not. And, you know, I just found your story so inspiring of how you could take a really big disappointment, turn it into a complete career change. And now 14 years later, like, you know, being able to go back and tell yourself in Los Angeles 14 years ago, Hey, like, don't, there, this is going to be a wild journey, but like it's, hang in there. It's going to be all right. Yeah. You know, I just feel really inspired by that. And I, I'm so glad that we were able to make this happen while you were here. And I just, I feel like your perspective as well. And like, we talked about the pilot community, but like, you're, you're not the only story of a guy that lost his wings and is able to get them back or a guy, a kid that had a dream to be a pilot. And for a while that wasn't going to be the case. And now they can, you know, thinking of Pietro, who's a young guy and was diagnosed with diabetes, his path to being a commercial pilot seemingly gone. And then yeah. gets to be one of the first, if not the first person in the U S to get his class one medical with type one diabetes. And like, there's still, it's still early. You know, we still get to be, we're still in the first generation of people with diabetes doing things for the first time. Yeah, that's right. And it's, I think it's only going to get easier from here. You know, the closed loop pumps are just going to get better and better. And someone will make some advancement with islet cell implants. Someone will figure that out. It is the, that, that incapacitation risk, you know, the worry from the flying point of view, it's just going to get easier and easier to manage and it's going to be more and more accessible. So, uh, yeah, I think things only look better from here. It's cool, man. I, you know, knowing that and just thinking about telling kids and like telling people when I get to go out and meet them, meet them that there are pilots flying commercial aircraft with type 1 diabetes. And you may not know it, but you might be on one of their flights. I mean, I, I love, I, and when I used to fly, I always used to love getting kids into the flight deck at the end of the flight and just letting them sit in the seat and pull levers and press buttons and stuff like that. And I think when... Uh, yeah, when the first little kid that's got type 1 diabetes comes up to visit the flight deck after a flight, that'll be a really special moment. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. I was definitely the kid that would win the cockpit. My, my dad would always take me up to the front of the plane yeah. on the international flights, and I'd want to see all this, like, this stuff. And they would let you touch the button. So it would be so cool to see a guy with a, hey, kid, 
Look at my meter. Look at my CGM. What a moment. That yeah, exactly. is going to be sweet. Maybe you'll cry then, too. Yeah, probably. I, I would. <laughs> I know some parents are going to be crying, <laughs> for sure. For sure. It's going to be real, real, real misty in there. But it's um, also just very inspirational. I, I don't think we think about enough what that does to little kids. I know for me, I was a little kid with diabetes. Seeing adults with diabetes doing cool things did spark something in my brain. Mm. Did make me think, oh, I see me a little bit. But me. Well, you, you have to expand your mind to what's possible, yeah. right? You know, for me with Gary Forbes, like Gary Forbes in the NBA, like he has diabetes, like that's possible. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Jeremy in the cockpit of a of a commercial airliner flying, you know, that for somebody that could be the whole reason they go to flight school. Yeah. You know, you know Eritrea going from Sweeney Condor Man recipient to like leading global <laughs> panels. You know, like those are, those are real. Again, I, I just keep coming back to 101 years ago. Yeah. There was, we died. You know, there yeah, was nothing, exactly. there was nothing around. And because of two guys on a summer project with, you know, their backs against the wall coming up with this awesome solution. And now, you know, over the, the next hundred years, all the people who have, progress we were talking about some other members of the diabetes community kind of gen one diabetes online yeah. community and how that's grown how our platform has evolved and grown and we've been able to reach people like the next generation of people is going to do amazing amazing things because of the groundwork that's been laid by the people who have been blazing these trails so again i have to reiterate i talk about you all the time so just people ask oh you know what's the cool story you or you know what you know tell me like what do you, what's your favorite interview of the podcast? Like, well, you know, there's this guy, <laughs> he's a pilot, but he's also a doctor because, you know, when he got delivered this bad news, he, he found a way to, to, to make a change. And now he's going to be a pilot again. And that journey to me is just like, if, if there was no other reason that we did this podcast, like that to me was enough. So, um, you know, like I said, I could I could brag about Jeremy Robinson, all no, I, Dr. Jeremy Robinson. I want to say that I think these last couple episodes, and especially this one, maybe it's part of me growing up. I feel like I'm growing up on this pod. It's kind of weird. But the takeaway seems to be like it doesn't happen overnight. Like mm. it really, really, really doesn't happen overnight. And we live in a culture and a society where it's all instant gratification on our phones and the computer and all this stuff. And listening to someone go on a journey for 14 years like where it starts very like I don't know what's happening to now this is it is inspiring it is motivational I didn't know you before today so it is nice to meet you and then know that you're a real person that you're not some like Instagram figure that just you know yeah. posts it's it's real it's life it's yeah. blood sweat and tears and mm. that's crazy I think too we we talked a lot about it you never know I, I think a bit that I was doing what years ago when people would ask me, and I, I still kind of do it, but when people ask me like, well, what's something you would tell your younger self? I would joke that I probably was told all the right stuff. I just, it just wasn't the right time for me to hear it, or I wasn't mature enough mm. to, to receive it. And I, th I think about that when you're talking about the, the longevity aspect is I heard this first, I think from Tony Robbins years ago, but it's like people overestimate what they could do in a, in a day and underestimate what they could do or overestimate what they could do in a year and underestimate what they could do in a decade. And, you know, it's been almost 10 years since you were on the podcast the first time. And from just from there to here, like all like, and you still have three more years of that to go. So it's yeah. like 14 years with diabetes, all of the ups and downs, certainly low moments, certainly high moments. But I remember you coming home from that event, you were at that conference and there was the, you know, the big conference dinner and how excited you were about the conversations that you had at that conference. Yeah. And then in the subsequent five years, six years, all of the advancements globally, not just in Australia, not just in the US, like all over the world, opening things up for people with diabetes. And I just, you know, I'm just glad I got to be on the sideline for that. Like that yeah. to me is like, if I hadn't have started the podcast, gotten and raised up and said, hey, I'm curious about this, I wanna get involved, I never would have met you and we wouldn't be here having this conversation today. And I wouldn't even know about all these amazing people who were doing all this work behind the scenes. Yeah. Well, I, it's my favorite quote of yours. You know, we live in the, the diabetes renaissance. It's, yeah. That's a Rob Howe? Oh, man. Well, if it isn't, I'm, I'm going to attribute it to him. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think I did. I did. I, that was one of my presentations, Living in the T1D Renaissance. Probably one of my first ones, honestly. Maybe you should revisit that one. Yeah, yeah, this, this is good. Yeah. yeah, It'll preach, right? That's far. As they say over here, yeah. Yeah, we are. I, and I think, you know, last year that was really reinforced for me when we went to ADA, the ADA scientific sessions, because something that I think about a lot is when I was diagnosed, they talked about 
automated insulin delivery. They talked about hybrid closed loop systems that, that, that someday you're going to be able to look at your phone or your pump and see what your blood sugar was. Yeah. And now we're living in that. That's and right. I love, I love looking at my watch. There boom, it is. Boom. Mm. Oh, yeah. I don't even have to pull the pump out. I don't yeah. have to prick my finger. I can just do it really on the low. And now the next five years of stuff that's coming is unbelievable. There's a new, a new pump just got approved this week that's super small. Mm. Uh, Movie. And, I'm so lit. And yeah, I know, I know you are. Where, where is it? Where are you <laughs> um, need to get we yours? pause. Wait, we'll see. We'll but and then, you know, even beyond that is like, okay, well, 14 years ago, there were no, you know, the CGMs were kind of around, but very minimal, right? Yeah, I, I remember. Not very accurate. Yeah, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. difficult to wear and didn't integrate with the pump always. Yeah. And now, you know, they're smaller and more connected and you can share them. Dude, this non-invasive CGM is coming out. Like the Apple Watch is about to announce in the next six months that they can read your glucose from your Apple. Exactly. That's crazy. So that, those types are really inconvenient things. So when someone's diagnosed today, they can get on an automated insulin delivery system relatively quickly. In the yep. UK, that's NHS has passed out. I think in the same in Australia, yep. right? Yep. So it's all publicly funded if you're under 18. Mm. So, you know, you're going to have access to those things, which makes your life with diabetes better. And the next wave of that is going to continue. So I just feel like we are in the T1D renaissance. This is, it, it is a, it, diabetes is terrible. We all would give it back if we could. But the, the good that's coming out of it and the opportunities that are coming out of it for people, mm. I think, are have never been more abundant. Yeah. yeah, I would agree. So. Cool. All right, well, you guys don't get to go to dinner with, with me and Jeremy, <laughs> but you just trust that we're going to have a good time. So, Jeremy, I want to thank you, man, for all your support over the years and just for being a true friend of the podcast and a friend of mine in real life. And, man, welcome back to Dallas. Now, again, thank you very much for having me. It's just it's fantastic to be here in person. In Dallas with Big Tex as your guide, who could do it better? I don't know. I know. know. <laughs> and like, you know, you guys want to know what it's like to hang out with Rob Howe. Well, Michael J. Fox is going to throw up on your bed. <laughs> Enzo's going to go to the bathroom in your room. And you still get to be friends after that. So yeah. it's just Cute. real life. Y'all are cute. <laughs> All right. See you guys next time.